I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Peace, everyone. Hotep, good to be back. It's been about, damn, about two months since I've been on the show. Um, definitely want to give everyone a chance to come in the building. We have an exciting show tonight, uh, one we've been working on for some time. Uh, Dr. Milana Karanga. If you don't know who he is, <laughs> I need you to get up under that from under that rock that you're under. Um, what a brilliant scholar, a uh, brilliant brother, brilliant gentleman, and we're just so happy and honored that he's here with us live tonight on Happy Talks. <clears throat> My name is Taki Grant, and welcome to another exciting edition of Happy Talks. And um, let's see who we got in the building. Um, people are coming in right now. We got Kwasi Kareem, peace. Uh, DB Smiley, peace. And Michelle Jewell, um, sister, we love you, peace. Um, just like give, give, give people a few chance, you know, some opportunity to come in and we'll start the show. And um, <clears throat> another brother DM in the building, Deborah Smith, peace everyone. Uh, we wanna talk about a couple of quick things. Um, first and foremost, the screening or better yet, the restoration of consciousness weekend that we have going on in Houston um, coming up on Saturday, January 8th and Sunday, uh, January 9th. Powerful event, um, Professor James Small and Dr. Wade Nobles will be presenting on the Sunday, I'm sorry, Saturday the 8th at the uh, <clears throat> Shrine of the Black Madonna in Houston, Texas. A beautiful venue that we have to support. Uh, we definitely wanna make sure that we are you know, if you're in the Houston area or the Texas area, you might want to come out for that. The next day, we have the powerful panel discussion, which is going to follow the film. We're going to show the film. They have a panel discussion for those who have not seen Hoppy. We know many of you have. Also, very important to note on that weekend is the vendor opportunities. The opportunities for vendors to come out and be a part of this experience at the Shrine of the Black Madonna, something very different. We haven't done it in other venues, but this is a, a one of the reasons why we talk about us doing our own thing is because we have this space, this beautiful black space that we can allow um, and be a part of this vendor experience. So in the Houston area, again, um, definitely want to get at us. If you're a vendor, uh, happyfilm.com, just send me an email. And with that email, we'll set you up with an application um, <clears throat> to be a part of that experience. Also with Kemet and the One Africa Return to the Source Conference and Study Tour, uh, we have the book, the, mem the memorable commemorative book for businesses that are out there people you know since day one we've been really big on the cooperative economics dealing with other businesses um so yay hey if you got a business please take this opportunity to showcase your business and something that's going to be going on forever and ever so this book is going to be a keepsake i think i'm going to be talking about this for generations so you definitely want to make sure that your business is represented on that you're represented in this book um you can send me an email at happyfilm.com if those who are interested uh it's very important to make sure that you get yourself in because it's very limited space because the book itself is going to be a not just a regular book but it's going to have the the articles by the 11 scholars that are in there images from throughout kim it's going to be an actual book and you have the opportunity to showcase who you are in there as well uh the prices are very nominal again we'll send you an application to send me an email and we would definitely do that. Uh, definitely shout out to you, uh, Jimboku Timbo. Also very important, you know, we always say, please like, like this video and share it. Um, we gotta get this video shared to as many people as we possibly can. Um, very important that we get this word out. Um, we have a, uh, a great show tonight, you know, so we get these, these likes up beat the algorithm of YouTube and Facebook and, you know, get the likes up. If you're on whatever platform you're watching it on, make sure you like it and make sure you also share it to about four people to share it on your page. Just, just share it. Um, shout outs 
you know, blessing to you, Austin Kurt. Definitely want to give a shout out to you. Um, Tony Nelson, C's, dealing the real, you know, shout out to everyone here in the building. We appreciate you we guys, and we also love and respect you. Right now, we're just waiting for um, Dr. Milana Karani to come back. There's some, maybe some technical difficulties on this end. Just if you stand by for one quick second, please don't go nowhere because he was just behind stage. We'll make sure we'll get him with you guys shortly. In the meantime, while we're waiting for him, we may do something a little different tonight. Um, maybe have a little call-in session. Let people call in for a minute or two and you know, just tell us what they what's they've been working on, what they've been thinking, and what's going on on their minds. Uh, we're gonna put the number up in a minute um, so that you guys can give us a call and kind of see, um, you know, like I said, some of the things that you want to share. Um, what does 2022 look like for you? Some people are like, I don't believe in the Gregorian calendar. I hear you. Whatever calendar you subscribe by, but this year here that we just embarked upon or this time period, like, what does that mean to you? So we're going to, you know, get that number out to you shortly and give you guys an opportunity to, um, to chime in. All right, so <clears throat> the number is, and Felicia will put it up on the screen in a second, 646-907-8344, and we'll give the doctor some time, give Baba Milana Karinga some time to get back in. Uh, he was in a minute ago, but um, he kind of went out, so I'm not really sure. I know some technical difficulties, so just stay here with us. Don't go no place, and anybody want to call, just talk about some stuff, want to build. We can again a number six four six nine zero seven eight three four four. Call us, let you call us, let let us know what's on your mind. All right, we know somebody got something they got to say. <laughs> or better yet, let me see. What does this happy? What does happy mean to you? Um, how has it impacted your life, if any at all? Maybe a good opportunity. Um, normally, we don't necessarily do this. We don't break out into live phone calls. We just keep the interviews pretty much um, going as they intended to. So tonight, be a good opportunity to kind of get into some things. You know, we're living in a crazy world right now. There's a lot happening, um, but there's a lot of good things on the horizon. You know, we're looking forward to this upcoming experience in Kemet. Um, for me, it's it's a, been a remarkable journey and I'm just happy to have the opportunity to share it with so many different people. So, you know, guys, just, you know what I mean? We got an opportunity to just kind of like, just, just build from a minute. Shout out to King Simon. KSP TV, good brother, always supportive with everything that we're doing. Um, I don't want to get too far and start talking about things, and I got to stop in terms of like getting to some like historical data. So I just want people to kind of like just tell us what's on your mind. Okay, well, why don't we do this? Um, being that I got nothing to talk about, 
I just do the talking here, talk about certain things. We could talk about this, what we call the happy compass, right? I know we talked about it slightly in the past, but I don't think we really never gotten to it yet, what it represents, what it signifies. Each aspect, each letter is a represents an, um, an acronym for what happy stands for stands for. Outside of the historical, cultural, spiritual aspect of happy, the H is home. It speaks to the importance of home. The A is assets, talks about the importance of assets. P is politics and I is investment. And we formulated this symbol because we see happy as being a journey, a journey through time, a journey that can also help us orient ourselves in a proper direction. So this happy thing for us is this movement that's just growing and growing and growing. And one second, guys, could we have somebody calling in? Peace and Black Power. What are you calling? New York, how are you? How you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, what's your name? Oh, this is Bianca. I had a, I had a, a quick thought. I was wondering what people um, people thought about you know how much how much of our culture as we begin to learn it should we share with um, people who are not black? I was wondering if anybody wants to talk about that. I've been in that situation and I get different answers. Some people say, you know, say very little, you know, <laughs> you know, others are like, you know, talk to, uh, you know, people who are trying to be allies, but you know, how much, I wonder if anybody wanted to address that question. All right. I just want to make sure everyone heard that. Just someone give me a sh uh, something in the chat. If you heard that, like uh, you could put a B1 something just said, you heard the sister's question. Okay, so the question was how much of the culture, and we, by the way, Dr. Karenga is back. We're gonna take this this one question, then we're gonna to go to our interview. Um, you can give it to him, because I was gonna ask him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll do that then. We'll hold off and we'll see his thoughts on that. And it's something we'll ask him at the end of the week. Thank you very much, sister. All right? Absolutely. All right, Thank peace. You. So, all right, guys, we have Dr. Karenga back. I just wanna just, um, before we bring him on the show, I want to go over his bio real quick because this is such an extraordinary, brilliant scholar. His educational overview, Milana Karenga is a professor and chair of the Department of Africana Studies at California State University, Long Beach. He holds not one, but actually two PhDs. His work is always focused on Ma'at. Professor Karenga, an ethical philosopher, is the leading exp exponent of Ma'atian ethical thought having developed over the last three decades a creative and scholarly Kawaita inter interpretation of ancient Egyptian ethical thought as a living tradition and a useful philosophical option for critical reflection on urgent issues of our time. Hmm. His published work, Dr. Karang is the author of over 17 books and monographs and four co-edited books, 57 journal articles, 42 book chapters, over 650 columns and commentaries on critical, critical issues and numerous encyclopedias of entries. We all know Dr. Karenga through Kwanzaa. His Kwanzaa work, Dr. Karenga is also internationally known as the creator of Kwanzaa, an African-American and Pan-African holiday celebrated throughout the world, African community on every continent in the world. His field of teachings and research with Black Studies are Black Studies Theory, History and Pedagogy, Af uh, Africana, Philosophy, ancient Egyptian Mahatian ethics, ancient Yoruba, Ifa ethics, African -Amer American intellectual history, ethnic studies, multiculturalism, and the social ethical thought of Malcolm X. He's currently writing a book on deep thinking of African studies titled The Jair Deep Thinking in African Studies, Africana Studies, excuse me, cultivating critical, creative, and ethical reflections. So, any further ado, we'd like to bring in Dr. Milana Karenga. Like is there we go. Dr. Karen, your 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 mic seems like it's on uh it's muted right now. Okay, I turned there, it off. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> you look good, sir. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. We're very happy to have you. Do so. Uh -huh. So yeah, we you know, we're going through um your bio. We mentioned some things. I know it's more extensive than that, but we wanted to give people um it's a brief 
overview of, of some of your works. Yeah. And there's so many more, but we definitely want to touch on that. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that? No, this is good. However you go, we can develop as we have to have our dialogue. And thanks for okay. the invitation uh, to talk with you on these critical issues and the development of uh, our interest in and work in uh, classical African uh, civilization and how we bring that uh, to enrich our lives. Uh, in other words, to ground, to, to use it in the way we live our lives, do our work, and wage our struggle uh, for good in the world. And that's what we have done uh, in a very particular way, uh, how we eat away, as we would talk about. Okay, okay. So I just want to get started on something very simple here. Who are some of the people that inspired you? Well, a whole group of people. And certainly, uh, the Honorable Marcus Garvey, Messenger Elijah Muhammad, Minister Haji Malcolm X, um, Anna Julia Cooper, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, Ella Baker, uh, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Amika Cabra, Franz Fanon, Julius Nayeti, and I could go on, but uh, those are just some people uh, uh, whose work uh, I, I grounded myself in and used uh, uh, to lay the basis for my own philosophy called Kawaida. Right, right. We actually had that a little further on, but you mentioned it a couple of times here. We might as well get into that right now. What is Kawaida? Kawaida is an ongoing synthesis of the best of African thought and practice in constant exchange with the world. So that Kawaida uh, is a philosophy of life, work, and struggle. And what I try to do in it is to constantly engage African culture, dialogue with African culture, dialogue with the rest of the world, and bring forth the best of what it means to be African and human in the world. Okay, all right. So is it an organization that people can join, people can be a part of, um, could yes. I, you know? Is, is my voice uh, muffled? Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. It's a little background. Um, static but i can hear you well yeah i'm sorry about that happened when you took me off that first time it broke the connection on my regular computer so i'm using laptop and it's not as good we might have to do this again you know <laughs> listen we'd love to have you on many times as we can that is definitely okay. the plan so, so I know you have um, a lot to share so yeah people can join the organization us uh, we celebrated our 56th anniversary and us means us african people and we chose that name for several reasons. Number one, to show the focus on the people. Uh, second, to draw a clear line of opposition between them and us, between the oppressor and us. And third, to reaffirm our rootedness in communitarian African values. Not just any values out there, but communitarian values, values that stress and strengthen family, community, and teach culture as a fundamental grounding for what it means to be human in the world because we 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 see culture as our fundamental way of being human in the world right and we take the position that each culture and people is a unique and equally valid and valuable way of being human in the world and so african is our unique and equally valid and valuable way of being human in the world oh that's powerful so baba karanga as African Americans, what is our role when it comes to the restoration of consciousness? Do, do we have one? Yeah. Uh, as Africans in America, I should say, excuse me. Yeah. So, I appreciate what you said, if I'm saying, but I see African people and the role that they have played in this country since they were came here is a moral and social vanguard whose struggles not only bring them closer to full and final liberation, but actually expand the realm of human freedom in this country and therefore the world. And that's why all the other marginalized groups and somehow relate to our struggle and use our struggle as a model to emulate. You know, they borrow our moral vocabulary and our moral vision and pose our struggle as a model to emulate. Whether we're talking about the other ethnic groups, Native Americans, uh, Latinos, Latinas, uh, Asians, whether we talk about women, whether we talk about the LGBT uh, people, whether we talk about seniors or disabled people, they say just like the blacks. So they use us as a reference. Same with South, uh, South America, 
in Africa, in Asia, right? In the even in the European democratic movement, they uh, sang our songs and borrowed our moral vocabulary. In the Arab Spring, they sang our songs, borrowed our moral vocabulary, and posed our struggle as a model to end. In the Palestinian liberation struggle, it's the same. So that black people have to see themselves as a world social and moral vanguard. And that means they must speak first truth to the people, not too powerful. Street, speak truth to the people because the people are the infinite resource for struggle and for transformation of themselves in the world. And then we can speak truth to power. And then we must challenge power. And we must engage in education, mobilization, organization, and confrontation for, for a certain transformation of this country and the world. So I see us as key, a key people in a key country, and we must understand ourselves. It's always used as example huh, of science fiction or Star Trek that was a planet called Telos 4. And on it, the people made people think they hadn't done what they've done. And the European oppressor does that to black people, make black people feel they haven't done what they actually did, cow their mind, so that when they come on TV or they come on a podcast, they begin to talk about what black people haven't done rather than what black people did. If you ask them what black people did, they might not know, but they can tell you what's wrong. And that's because they borrowed the pathological vocabulary of the dominant society. And we must reject all that. And we must speak our own special culture truth and make our own unique contribution to how this society is radically reconceived and radically reconstructed. Wow, there it is. There it is. Listen, people, I need to tell you what you need to do here. We're just getting started. And you already see where this interview is going. You definitely need to like and share this video. Get it out to as many people as we can, because this is going to be a powerful discussion. Dr. Karenga, amongst many of your great works, there seems to have been a focus on the understanding of spiritual literature, as well as achieving an effective model for my art. Why is this important? Yeah, well, appreciate what you said, if I understand correctly. We developed an um, organization, us, in the midst of the Black liberation movement, the Black freedom movement. And you want to make a distinction between black freedom movement and the civil rights movement. Because a lot of times, the European, in order to insert himself in our history, calls it the civil rights movement, and even calls Malcolm a civil rights leader. When you know Malcolm criticized the focus on civil rights and argument for human rights. So we have the black freedom movement, and there's two phases to it. 1955 to 1965 is the civil rights phase, and 1965 to 75 is a black power phase. And we have to make a distinction here but overall, we must talk about the Black Freedom Movement. We must rescue that term from the dominant society. To struggle for freedom is a long ways from struggling for civil rights. Human rights as, and, and freedom is a human right. Human right, as Minister Malcolm, Haji Malcolm said, is a natural right. We are born with that. They don't give us that. We don't have to petition them for that. We just have to exercise it and struggle against those who would deny us that. Whereas civil rights is a petition for the government to treat you in a certain way. But we must always, you know, struggle for human rights. And so that's a very important thing. So we're in the black freedom movement, right? And so we begin to ask, what is it? I left, I was actually, when the black freedom movement, the black power uh, phase started, I was at UCLA finishing my first doctorate, right? And I left. I later finished my first document, got a second, which I'll talk about in a moment, because that's when I go into uh, the ethics of ancient Egypt. Uh, so anyhow, the question was, what should we do with our knowledge? What can we do with our knowledge? Dr. Mary McCaffrey Thune said, those of us who have knowledge must discover the dawn and then share it with the masses of our people and our youth who need it most. We must constantly discover the, the light of knowledge how can they, you know, take control of their own destiny and daily life, become self-conscious agents of their own life, live lives of dignity and decency, and leave a legacy for those who come after? That's a great challenge for us as a people and for other people, but especially for us uh, as an oppressed and struggling people. And so I built institutions. That's what I, I wanted to build, the organization US. I, I developed my philosophy, Kawa Eden. Uh, I uh, created the holiday uh, Kwanzaa. I first developed and authored the seven principles. 
And I created one of the reasons I created Kwanzaa was to introduce and reaffirm uh, the um, seven principles in Guzo Saba, uh, uh, which most people know in terms of Kwanzaa, but really is a value system, a black value system, which is supposed to practice, and many do, all year round. And those values, is, most people know, oh, Moja, unity, Kujichagalia, self determination, Ujima, collective working responsibility, Ujima, cooperative economics, Neo purpose, Kuunga creativity, and Imani's faith. Now, we always had a value orientation because we accepted what Cabral would later argue that even if our demand seemed essentially political, there's always a moral dimension to it. And so the question becomes, how do we develop the best of what it means to be African and human? That's a moral question. How do we speak our own special culture truth? And it represents the best of what it means to be African and human in the world. And so I began, as I said, to develop my philosophy. And I developed a philosophy called Kawaita. And Kawaita was seen as a cultural philosophy, a philosophy of social and cultural change. We put a lot of emphasis on culture. And when we said culture, we're not talking about song and dance or art even, or performances, or wearing clothes, or any of that. That was people who were just hating on us, wanting to misrepresent us, right? From various points, especially the Cointel Pro and the dominant society in the state. They misrepresent us. And so what we said is that uh, we need culture, that the key crisis in black life and the key, ch key, uh, key challenge in black life is a culture challenge and crisis. And that until we break the monopoly that the oppressor has on so many of our minds, liberation is not only impossible, it's unthinkable. It's inconceivable. If you can't imagine reform, how do you make revolution? So the question is the struggle to be ourselves and to free ourselves. And our struggle was always, Taki, our struggle was always a dual struggle, a struggle to be ourselves and to free ourselves. And we can't be our, we, we can't free ourselves unless we be ourselves, but we can't fully, fully be ourselves until we fully free ourselves. So that's the dialectic there. That's the inseparable aspect of being ourselves and freeing ourselves. And we're taking Du Bois right after the March on Washington. He said, I'm concerned about my people. And Du Bois was another influence on my life. I mean, I'm telling intellectuals, you know, uh, just like all the other ones, but he, you know, had a special role. And he said, I'm afraid for my people because they don't recognize their own gifts sometimes. And they'll be so, especially, you know, he's talking really about the petty bourgeoisie, not the masses. But they are so interested in integration that they will accept European conceptions of reality rather than infuse their own, rather than bring to the table their own, which is such a rich understanding of life, a rich understanding born of struggle, born of deep thinking, born of exchange and relation building, right? And they have got to get away from the consumer's attitude the vulgar individualism, the capitalist conception of social Darwinism, right? The strong uh, are supposed to have the moral right uh, to oppress the weak. And instead, talk about we measure you know, the moral quality of any society by how it treats its most vulnerable people, right? And we'll get back to that later. But that's that. those are the conversations that went uh, into what we were doing uh, in um, the organization. Uh, in the 60s, we rejected organized religion. We, we were severe on organized religion, and especially white racist versions of it, as Malcolm also criticized, right? And then we saw that maybe we're alienating people, that we should, instead of spend a lot of time on the white versions of Christianity, ask ourselves, what is good in these religions? What is that? And one of the things is faith. And righteous relationship with each other, righteous relationship with the environment, right? And so we said, well, what is the African way of doing this? Now, we know the religious ways, but culturally, what are the African ways? And that's why we turned to Egypt, to classical civilization, because we asked ourselves, how can we find out what Africans thought before the coming of the Europeans? 
What is it? And Egypt represented that because of its antiquity, because of its abundance of documents, because of its level of achievement, because of its contribution to the world, and because of its offering models and paradigms of human excellence and achievement for us and all African societies. And that's where we begin to read Diop, right? We begin to read Diop, and Diop says, we must rescue ancient Egypt. And until we return Egypt to African history, we can, we'll always look like debtors to the world rather than the world is indebted to us. And check, check on the Diop, uh, may the good he left last forever, uh, he said that we return to Egypt not as dilettante. He makes a distinction between him and the dilettantes, right? He said the distinction is, I want, we've already proved Egypt is black. The question is, what do we do with it to enrich our lives, right? To, to sharpen our thinking, to deepen our capacity to understand ourselves in the world. How do we do that? And he said, if we embrace Egypt right, then it will have three fundamental functions. Number one, it'll reconcile African history with human history. And why is that necessary? Because the European, in order to augur their madness, their racist madness, lifted Africans out of Egypt, Egypt out of Africa, and then Africa out of human history. And so we are returning Egypt to African history, right? So that Africa can speak for itself, right? Second, he said, to return to Egypt is to also lay the basis for building a new body of human sciences, right? More African, more human, right? right? And the third, that is a fundamental way to renew African culture. And since we are culture nationalists, revolutionary culture nationalists, and I need to stop right here and tell you what culture nationalism is because that's another thing, disinformation, misinformation, you know, like dishonest, presentation by many, many uh, black scholars, and of course, the white racist scholars are going to do this, but here's what Kawida, revolutionary nationalism, is about. And we say that culture is central, right? What we say is that culture is not simply art and thing. Culture is the totality of thought and practice by which a people creates itself, celebrates, sustains, and develops itself, and introduces itself the history of humanity. And they do that at least in seven fundamental areas. And we should do our work in these areas. It doesn't mean we don't do other work, but this, at least in these areas. First, in the area of spirituality and ethics or religion. Second, history, social organization, economic organization, political organization, creative production, which is your art, your music, your literature, right, dance, etc. And then ethos, the collective psychology we achieve as a result of practice and achievement in the other six areas. So that's what we mean by culture. And so what is culture national? It is probably the revolutionary culture national is based on three fundamental propositions. The first is that the defining feature of any people or nation is its culture. Second, that for a people to be itself and free itself, it must be self-determined, self-conscious, self-determining, and rooted in its own history and culture. And third, that the success, pardon me, that the quality of life of a people and the success of its revolutionary struggle or its liberation struggle depends upon it doing two things, waging cultural revolution within and political revolution without, resulting in the radical transformation of self, society, and the world. We took the position with Fanon. It's not enough to dare to change society. We must change ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be the same people doing things that makes our oppressor our teacher. And Fanon said the revolution, the liberation struggle succeeds to the precise degree that each person takes it upon him or herself to begin an irreversible liberation of themselves in the context of the collective struggle. And so that's how we imagine, and that's how we've been struggling for 56 years. And all the people that talk wild and about what they're going to do, where are they now? What are they doing, right? That's the question. We don't turn our back on our blackness. 
We don't see black as a yellow wig we can put on and take off at night, right? And put back on in the morning. We see blackness as a fundamental way of describing our understanding of sin. Because blackness, as we said in the six, is not simply color. There's some dark white people. Blackness is color, culture, and consciousness, right? Not only are you dark or you have genetic origins in Africa, but also you learn your culture. We're fundamental cultural beings, right? There's nobody that doesn't have a culture, right? And if they don't have a culture, it's because they've been stripped of their own and given fake culture by the oppressor. So culture, fundamental ways of being human in the world, equally valid and valuable way of being human in the world. And then finally is consciousness. And that is awareness of yourself, right? Awareness of the goals that you must have in order to be a full human, in order to realize oneself and come into the fullness of oneself. Consciousness of the struggle, consciousness of your obligation to each other, your obligation to the struggle, your obligation to the world, your obligation to the past, your obligation to the future. And as uh, Ida B. Wells said, willingly accept those obligations. You mentioned a couple of times about the ethical and, and moral position we should take. And from my understanding, that is Ma'at. Can you explain to us what Ma'at is? Yes. So one of the things that we did when we went into the study of ancient Egypt, we, we first, before we did this, we saw Africa. And this is what makes us distinct from any other group I know. Maybe there's other groups. But we see Africa as our moral and spiritual idea. What does it mean to have an idea, a moral and spiritual idea? The idea means that you have a composite, a composite of views and values that reveal your concept of the transcendent, mm -hmm. second, right and wrong, right? relational obligation, rules of conduct, and concept of the good person, the good society, and the good world, right? And so we said, we must find in African cultures values and views and practices that represent the best of what it means to be African and human. Create that as a tradition and constantly use reason to update and expand it all the time. So everything we do is based on tradition and reason. Tradition is our foundation. Reason is the way we keep our culture alive you know, a living practice, a growing and developing reality uh, for us. And so one of the things we, we said is that Egypt is an excellent place for this. And un unlike most people who monumentalized Egypt, who just want to go see the pyramids and talk about our contribution, we argued that the best way to discuss Egypt is to discuss is ethical tradition and that the fundamental way we need to relate to Egypt, not dismissing the other ways, right? You know, science, math, technology, but ethics, because the Martian idea infused science and math and technology in ancient Egypt, its art, its literature, is all informed by the concept of mind. And so I I thought that it was important for us. See, I'm always doing things, not simply as an intellectual exercise, but also dealing with how to enrich, how to ground and enrich our lives, and give us the foundation and framework for grounding ourselves, orienting ourselves, and directing our lives toward good and expansive ends. And so what happens here is I'm looking at Egypt, and I'm saying, what is the most characteristic, most defining feature of it? And I'm saying, it's the idea of mind. And so what I begin to do in our organization is have these conversations with our members. And we decided that one of the things we could do is put everybody together that was interested in mind, or probably interested in Egypt, right, together and introduce them to a whole different way of understanding uh, Egypt, right? And to understand it essentially as mod. It doesn't mean that other people haven't mentioned the word mod or wrote, written an article. 
but to take it as a central fundamental way of understanding and engaging the civilization, this is something else. So in 1984, we planned our organization, us, regardless of people, you know, trying to change history, etc. We are the ones who planned, organized, called, and financed ASCAC, the founding of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization. We even named it, right? We have the first uh ancient egyptian at the uh pardon me the first annual ancient egyptian studies conference in los angeles here at southwest college people from 75 cities came all those who saw themselves as interested in and doing research in uh ancient uh, egyptian studies we called it and we called them together for several reasons number one to introduce our work on ancient Egyptian, especially the Husea, which we're talking about. This is a sacred text of ancient Egypt. Second, we did it <clears throat> to introduce and stress the concept of Mat as a fundamental way to understand and engage ancient Egyptian society. And third, we did it to build a community of scholars who were mainly working as individual researchers to get a community of scholars to begin a new trust around ancient Egyptian studies uh, in the Ethiopian sense. And then the fourth, we did this as a process and way to rebuild the movement. Because it's hard for me to separate my work, my intellectual work from the struggle. Black studies is an activist scholarship. It's not just scholarship, it's an activist scholarship. And as a Black studies scholar, and one of the founders of the field, I thought that it was important for us to always, always ask ourselves, how does it relate to the way we live our lives, do our work, and wage our struggle? And so we called these people together, and we began to talk about how best to understand ancient Egypt. And one of the things that happened, though, is that it, most people, uh, or many people, I should say, were more interested in the touring and the monument uh, conversation and the contribution conversation. But we continued doing what we were doing because the conference really just gave us a chance to display what we were doing. So we continued our internal development. Um, one of the things that we uh, did, uh, as you know, uh, was to introduce the Husea. The Husea uh, is a sacred text of ancient Egypt, which I collected and translated. And I assumed that it was going to be a 20 year project. And that's over 30 years and I have not finished, but I will eventually uh, finish that, okay? People used to say, we need a black Bible. I said, no, that's being Christocentric. We need a black sacred text that from Africa, you know, whose antiquity demonstrates the African quality of it, right? And then we, we, I, we also train a uh, saber mount, right? We train teachers. Some people are now using that term, but, <clears throat> It is we who introduced the idea of saver mod, a teacher of mod. Sometimes we shorten it and just say saver, but that's it. And then also conceptual generation. There was no seven cardinal virtues of mod before we introduced that. That's us. The seven cardinal virtues of mod are truth, justice, propriety, harmony, balance, reciprocity, and righteous order. Sometimes people take it and try to change the order. And all. I say, Make up your own. You know, don't change mine. Make up your own. You know? Why don't you just go in and say some other virtues? Why are you taking me? And if you're going to use them, have the intellectual honesty to make the right uh, attribution. Just say, Barana or Dr. Karina uh, did this, okay? And then, of course, we developed the conceptual generation like Martin ethics, Martin ontology, Martin anthropology, Martin society, a Martin person. We, had, we didn't have that kind of conversation before, and we do have that conversation, right? So whenever we create something, we can create and generate concept. Conceptual generation is key to me and my intellectual uh, contribution. We must find new ways of talking. Maybe some Malcolm X, Haji. When I say Haji, that means the person who made the honorific, the person who made the Haji method. So Haji Malcolm said in a lecture at Harvard, the logic of the oppressed cannot be the logic of the oppressor if they want liberation. 
So I said, yes, that's so. But if we need a new logic of liberation, we also need a new language of liberation to inform that logic. So we create a lot of categories that people can use, right? And that's why people borrow a lot from Kaweeda, even though they don't do a proper attribution. And finally, we wanted to produce an ever-expanding body of literature, lectures, forums, etc., uh, to actually teach this as a fundamental option in our time, a philosophical option to understand and address the essential problems facing African and human society. Thank you. So we know that Ma'at is, excuse me for saying this, but it's, it's generally, it's typically comedic. Are there other African traditions that have a similar ethic systems? And if so, what are they called? Well, I introduced also an ethics of Ifa, right? I translate the basic text of, um, uh, text of ancient Egypt, ancient Yoruba land called Odu Ifa. And Odu in Kawita tradition means basket of sacred wisdom. That Oludu Maru, the creator, right? Uh, gave humans to make the world good. So in our, in our theology of, of um, <clears throat> The theological narrative uh, of, of Ifa, the Ifa tradition, right? They, <clears throat> they say that <clears throat> when Ola Dumari made the world, he left it unfinished, right? He left it unfinished so that we could add to it, right? And so 781, Odu Ifa said, <clears throat> let's do things with joy. For surely humans have been chosen, divinely chosen, to bring good into the world. We say that's the fundamental mission and meaning of human life. And listen to that. Let's do things with joy. But surely humans have been divinely chosen to bring good into the world. So the fundamental mission and meaning of human life, or the Evite is to bring good into the world. And notice two things about this. <clears throat> in Yan, <clears throat> in Yoruba, means human being and chosen one. It's a beautiful concept and one I have not seen in all my study of religion because one of the things I did was to go to school to get a doctorate in ethics. And I studied many, many religions because I thought that ethics was one of the fundamental ways we had to engage the world and that we must have an ethical approach to our struggle and to our engagement with the world, both the social world, the human world, as well as the natural world, social world, as well as the natural world. And so here it says, human beings are chosen, all human beings, not just one group, right? I mean, this is what's different about this. All humans are chosen, and they're chosen not over and against anyone, right? They're chosen with everyone to do one thing, to bring good into the world. So whether you're a journalist or a judge, whether you're a farmer or a pharmacist, whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, a student, a teacher, or whatever you are, your mission in life, your purpose, fundamental purpose, is to bring good in the world, to take the vocation you've chosen and use it to bring good into the world. That's the beauty of it. And one of the most important chapters for me is 781 Odu which explains all this, what it means to have a good world, why it's important for all people to have the good world, the good position, the text says, that Olu Dumari ordained for everybody. So we must build a good world we all want and deserve and want to leave as a legacy worthy of the name African and human in the world. Wow. So <clears throat> you mentioned a few times um, the Hosea. Where can people go to um, get your books and support you? Yeah, it's in the chat, but it's Sancord Press, University of Sancord Press or Sancord Press. Yeah, uh, com. Okay. Sancourt Press. Okay, we'll put that up on there. It's very important. We call it Heartbeat Props. You gotta support these elders, you know, while they're here. Please go out and get some of this literature. So super important. Also, um, again, this discussion is very powerful. Please make sure you like, comment, subscribe, share, share, share the video. Also the Super Chats, Cash Apps people, definitely wanna support this discussion. It's gonna be an ongoing discussion for some time. You know, it's gonna live here on YouTube and other places. So. We definitely want to show some love here. Um, Dr. Karanga, 
you mentioned Hosea a few times. Why is it so important, so important for that particular book to be studied? You hear what you said, if I understand correctly. It's the oldest written, written record of black theological and ethical thought. And it is as deep and as meaningful and as fruitful as any other sacred text I've read. And I've read quite a few of them. And certainly, if we compare them with the Abrahamic tradition, certainly people can argue. Although I don't do it a lot because in a multicultural context, you just say these are parallel developments. But some people would argue since ours are more ancient, maybe people borrowed from and built on these. There are some clear, like the Book of Amenemope, it's clear that Solomon in writing his Proverbs, etc., that he borrowed from them. And, and scholars have shown that. Right? But it's a lot of things that people borrowed from Egypt because Egypt was considered at one time the light of the world, the navel of the world, and the temple of the world. Light of the world because of its knowledge, navel of the world because it was the origin of so many new and beautiful things, and temple of the world because of its deep spirituality and ethics. And it's interesting that the demonization of Egypt hides this history of ethical grounding. It's seen as a, as a mythical land of bondage, but there's no bondage. I mean. There's no bondage. Other people didn't build the pyramid. Africans built the pyramid. And it wasn't enslaved people that built it. These are people that worked on a national public project. But we can go into that later. So the Hussia. When I what 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 I decided in my organization, us supported me, it's always been it's invaluable to me, you know, to first discuss my ideas and then to embrace them like they did with Kwanzaa and then begin to take it around the country and the world. So I, I, I introduced the idea that we're talking about, we need a black sacred text. Let's go to Egypt, the most ancient uh, writings that we have and the abundance of documentation. And so I began to do the translation and I went back to school, to the university to get a PhD in social ethics. And I did of course, uh, have a second a doctorate in social ethics. And what I did before I even went to school, I put out a, a, a temporary version of this uh, for the Ancient Egyptian Studies Conference in 84 at the founding of ASCAP, right? And I named the sacred text Husia, made of two words, right? Hu and Sia. Hu means authoritative and creative uh, word. A speech, I'm sorry, authoritative and creative speech. And Sia means exceptional insight. And those are the powers by which Ra created the world. He conceived the world in his mind, spoke it into existence. This is just one way. There are many ways that Ra created the world. This is one of the fundamental words it was by speech, right? Authoritative and creative speech, right? And then the insightfulness, the deep insight exceptional insight uh, that he used to create the world. That's that's how I did so. And then I divided the Hussia into seven fundamental kinds of writing. I had to read all these writings. And then I wrote an 800 page dissertation for my doctorate on Ma'at, the moral idea in ancient Egypt, a study in classical African ethics. And all of this was used to in fact lay the intellectual basis for the translation and compilation of these sacred texts uh, called the Hussia. And it's important for us to do this because we need always to be spiritually and ethically grounded, right? We must be ethically grounded. We say when we talk about what it means to be a true African, it's first to be culturally grounded and second to be ethically grounded. You know, even if you're culturally grounded, and you miss the ethical element of that culture, it's an incomplete grounding. Only where that ethical element at the center of it, you know, do we in fact become serious, real people, mighty and people, right? Grounded in the best of what it means to be African and human in the world. Thank you for that. So, hey, just real quick, Felicia, put that back up against that core press. We want to make sure people. Um, take a minute and get this website 
and um, support the elder. Uh, make sure they go out and, and uh, buy several of the books, not just one. There's over 17 books. There's other things there also for purchase. Very important people see this. Now, Dr. Karanga, um, there's always discussion around what did ancient Kemet look like? Was it people more like the Batahotep side or just like regular commoner folks? Like, you know what I mean? Because there's always discussion whether they, the spiritual um, civilization or just was that individuals that are whose writings we find in the Husia? Were they the norm or were they the exception? Well, like all intellectuals, they're exceptions. It's not like everybody in the world is an exception. I don't know any country where everybody's an intellectual and everybody's writing, right? That the masses, and then there's the educated group, right? That's in this country and all over the world. So sometimes they like holding Egypt to a different standard, right? And just like, for example, they try to say that Egypt was a slave society and all that, but they don't talk about Israel as a slave a society <laughs> that had slaves. And even though they talk about it, they don't use it to condemn them. <clears throat> and, but <clears throat> that's part, <clears throat> pardon me, that's part of the demonization of ancient Egypt. And we uh, know that <clears throat> that keeps people from understanding the richness of it. So were there classes in ancient Egypt? Yes, there are classes in every society except small communal society. I don't know any place that doesn't have classes uh, that's not uh, that's larger than communal society. So uh, we have an intellectual group and strata, right? So let let's be honest. That's important. We can't put down and and, and question whether or not we should have intellectual. You know, and then uh, white people be bragging on their intellectual. Tell you you need to look at yours as if they have a problem. The question is their message, right? That's what I look at. Notice how I said the moral ideal, right? What does it mean, the ideal? Why didn't I say the moral practice? Right? Because we can only speculate about the practice, right? We got some evidence, but what I wanted to know is what is the moral idea? This is like when Christians and Jews and Muslims take their sacred texts, right? You can't go by what you see in Israel today or what you see in Arabia today. Rescue me if I'm wrong. People are talking about an idea of ancient Israel, right? It's best literature. Not even all of it's best practice, just it's best literature. And the same with Islam, right? And with Judaism, right? So when I talk about the idea, I mean the best of African thinking, the best of their views and values and practices, right? The concepts, as I said earlier, of the transcendent, the concept of relational obligation of right and wrong, of rules of conduct, and the concepts of the good person, the good society, and the good world. And that's the beauty of this. Like, for example, for people to have the equality of women, and we're still struggling with that. In this day, it's a historical struggle, you know that. But in ancient Egypt, women were legally equal, right? And they could hold any office, including pharaohs, right? They, we, in Egypt, we had the first male doctor in the M Hotel and the first female doctor, Pesesha, right? So we're still struggling. If you compare them to Israel, ancient Israel, ancient Babylon, ancient Greek, ancient Rome, where the woman was a ward of a husband or the state, had to get permission to go outdoors, you know? Whereas Herodotus uh, 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 is surprised that the women are in the market shopping you know that kind of so i think it's very important for us to appreciate the advancement that egypt represents in african history and in world history and talk from that position if you want to criticize it make a comparative a criticism and ask what is going on in these other societies these contemporary societies in antiquity and you'll see it's a whole different kind of world Hmm. So, Dr. Green, you spoke uh, several times about Kwanzaa, and I'm not sure a lot of people here, I see a lot of Kwanzaa uh, uh, posts uh, referencing Kwanzaa. What was the inspiration behind Kwanzaa? What inspired you to do it, to create it? I created Kwanzaa in the midst of the Black Freedom Movement, right? And again, I'm asking myself, as like the art of the film says, what are you going to do with your knowledge? Knowledge is a prime need of the hour, but the question is, 
what are you going to do with your knowledge? And she said, it's up to us uh, who know, again, to discover the dawn and share with the masses and our youth who need it most. And so what I did when I came out of school right, to join the movement, I thought about what can I do to contribute to the movement, right? To the Black Freedom Movement. And Kwanzaa for me became an act of freedom, an instrument of freedom, and a celebration of freedom. It's an act of freedom in that we declared it ourselves. We didn't petition and ask the federal government or the state government or the city government to uh, uh, anoint this holiday or to make it a state or federal holiday. We declared it and made it an international holiday so that it is celebrated all over the world, throughout the world, African community, on every continent in the world. So it was an act of self-determination. It was an act of freedom. It was a model of the struggle for freedom that we were waging, a struggle to be ourselves and to free ourselves from white culture and political domination. We defined ourselves. What did the second principle say? To define ourselves, right? To name ourselves, to create for ourselves, and to speak for ourselves. And Kwanzaa was a fundamental way of doing that. It's an instrument of, of, of struggle also, just like it's an act of, uh, of freedom. It's an instrument of freedom. How is it an instrument of freedom? Because it creates critical space to raise consciousness of being African in the world and the beauty and sacredness and awesome meaning of being African in the world. More than any other time, Black people discuss being African all over the world. Can you imagine that? For this week, right? Just fast, people on every continent in the world are discussing being African in the world, right? And celebrating it. So it also becomes then a celebration of freedom, right? Celebrating breaking from the culture hegemony of the dominant society, breaking through the catechism of impossibility and the negative pathological versions of ourselves that the Europeans have given us, right? And it's to celebrate beauty. That's that, to celebrate black people in a way we don't celebrate black people otherwise, right? So when white people, a lot of times black people say, "Can anybody celebrate Kwanzaa?" They're not really asking for the Native American or the Latino or the Asian. You know, they, they ask about white people, right? So the question is not whether or not anybody can celebrate Kwanzaa. The question is, can they celebrate black people? Because Kwanzaa is a celebration of black people. Can they come? and not be the subject of every sentence? Can they come and not want to demonstrate and dictate and, and, and make some kind of content, uh, some kind of comment that's off the wall and irrelevant? Can they just learn and listen? That's the question, right? If I go to a Jewish uh, Hanukkah celebration, I don't tell a rabbi, I sit down, take his yarmulke and start explaining, right? I just, hey, if I come there, I come to learn and to participate and to share. So that's the issue, right? So. I think it's important. So again, just to sum up, I created a Kwanzaa in the context of making it an act of freedom, an instrument of freedom, and a celebration of freedom, right? In the Black Freedom Movement. And I created it in terms of that for three basic reasons. Number one, to reaffirm our rootedness in African culture, because we have been lifted out of our own history and culture and made a footnote and forgotten casualty in other people's history and culture. And just as Emil Carr Cabral said, the liberation struggle is a struggle to return to our own history and culture. Why? So we can speak our own special culture truth, make our own unique contribution to the forward flow of human history. Second, I created Kwanzaa to give us a time when all over the world, we could in fact come together, reaffirm the bonds between us and meditate on the awesome meaning of being African in the world. What does it mean to be the fathers and mothers of humanity, of human civilization, to be the elders of the of humanity. What does that mean? What does that mean in terms of our intellectual and moral responsibility for creativity and right relationships with each other, other people in the world, right? In nature, right? What does that mean? What does it mean to be the sons and daughters of the Holocaust of enslavement? What does that say that about our love for freedom, right? And how we struggle and how we the, defied the attempts to dehumanize us, how we held on to our humanity in the most 
dehumanizing, inhuman, and savage situation. Hmm? What does that mean? What does that tell us? What does Harry Tubman and Frederick Douglass and Nat Turner and Denmark Vesey have to say? What does Nana and Gabriel Cropsey have to tell us and teach us? What does the ordinary African, enslaved African, have to teach us about not only the capacity to survive, but the capacity to prevail and to achieve? For example, they outlawed not only love, but our writing, our learning. They outlawed our learning, our love. And yet, in their outline, saying we couldn't read or write, you know, actually making a law against us reading and writing in less than a hundred years out of the Holocaust and slavery, we created a world class literature second to none. And then I created Kwanzaa. Not only give us time all over the world, every kind in the world, as it has happened, to come together and reaffirm the bond between us. But the third reason was to introduce the Nguzo Saba, the community and value system. I wanted to stress how important community and values were, a collective sense of our humanity. And I was reading, uh, I'm writing an article this week on uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and he was explaining Ubuntu, which, you know, is, is a common concept in ancient Africa. And, and that is the whole idea. So we cannot be human by ourselves. We must always be human in community. And people might say, you know, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. But we in Kawaita say, I'm related and relate, therefore I am. I come into being in relationship. Even before I'm born, I'm in relationship to my mother and father, to my past. I'm in relationship to the future that I will have and the future relationship I will build, right? So I'm always in relationship. And that brings me into being. The fullness of my humanity is determined by other people. And that's why you have the Zulu phrase, umuntu ngumuntu ngabantu. A human being or a person is a human being through other human beings. So I think it's very important for us uh, uh, to see that. And these communitarian values, the Nguzo Saba, teach us that that we need each other, that we are better when we recognize our interdependence and work together to build the good world we all want and deserve to live in. And so these values promote unity, you know, to strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race, and by extension, the world itself. Self-determination, to define ourselves, to name ourselves, to create for ourselves and to speak for ourselves. We team a collective working responsibility mm -hmm. to build and maintain our community together, make our brothers and sisters problems our problems, and to solve them together. Utama, to build and maintain our own stores, shops, and other businesses, and to profit from them together, profit from them together, shared work and shared wealth. We have purpose to make our collective vocation the building and development of our community in order to restore our people to their traditional greatness. But what is greatness? That's the moral again. The ancient Egyptians in the Husea say, the wise are known by their wisdom, but the great are known by their good deeds. So make our people great by the good deeds we do in and for the world. Develop things that advance humanity, right? That end suffering and poverty. And that enhances the capacity of all to live a free and flourishing life and come into the fullness of themselves. In a word, to advance African and human good and the well being of the world. And Kuumba creativity to do always as much as we can and where we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we live. But who is our community? We got a series of communities. We are African. We, we are African American. That's a community. We're African. That's a community. We are world historical people. That's a community. And in Swahili, we have two words for human beings. Watu, these are human beings as human beings. And then Walimwengu, those are world beings. So we're not just Africans and human beings, we're world beings, and we must relate to the world accordingly. In fact, we've got other dinners according to ancient Egyptian with divine beings in our relationship to the divine. That is to say, we're offspring in the image of the divine. We introduced that concept first before anyone. Second, but second, we also are also natural being as part of nature, not separate from it. And we're social beings as part of our community. So we have to see ourselves in this context, right? 
And we must, in fact, in Kuumba, create the good world we want and deserve. And in here, I usually put the ancient Egyptian concept of Saru's tie. Saru's tie is the moral imperative from Mat, Kawita Mat. And what I'm talking is Kawita Mat. You won't find this like in the ancient text. This is our interpretive practice, right? This is our interpretation of it in Kawita. So Saru's tie means to repair, renew, and remake the world. Constantly repair, renew, and remake the world. Making it more beautiful and beneficial then we inherit it, right? And and even before I knew this concept, I said, what? Kuumba is creativity. We do always as much as we can in the way we can, or to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we have. So root time means, I repeat, to repair, renew, and make the world. It says, the ancient text said, that we often damage the world, not only by what we do wrong, but what we also refuse to do right. So we become complicit in wrongdoing when we do not oppose it, right? And so what we must do is constantly speak truth, do justice, right? We must always do that. Then fine. So Saru's time means these things. To raise up what is in ruin. And by the way, this means both social and environmental, right? This is an environmental ethics, but it's also a social ethics because they're intricately and inseparably uh, linked. And, African thought and Kawita African thought, Kawita um, Hussitic thought, and Kawita Matian thought, right? So it says you must raise up Saru's top, raise up what is in ruin, repair what is damaged, rejoin what is the, the, uh, uh, separated, replenish what is depleted, set right what is wrong, strengthen what is weakened, and make flourish that which is fragile, insecure, and undeveloped. But a beautiful concept for what we do with the environment, but also what we do in our social relationship, right? And then finally, the seven principles of money, to believe with all our hearts in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and in the righteousness and victory of our struggle. So why do we start with the people? Always us, the people, right? right? We have to start with the people, right? People might say, well, when you talk faith, why didn't you say God? Well, we know you with God, right? The question is, and we know you love God. The question is, do you love your people? And if you don't love your people, you can't love yourself. Malcolm taught us that, right? You, 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 you can't feel good about yourself if you don't feel good about your people. So if you're going to be a revolutionary, if you're going to struggle righteously, then you must love the people, right? And so that's what we always stress, is the people, and then your parents, and then your teachers who teach right, who teach right, who teach the good, the right, and the possible, and the leaders who do and teach the right, the good, and the possible, right? But especially also, don't lose hope, no matter how bleak it looks, no matter how Arctic it looks, or Antarctic it looks, no matter how white it gets, right? That you always know in the final analysis, we will win this struggle, right? And Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King said, the arc of the moral universe is long to the bends towards us. And in that is a hope and a silent knowledge that Martian scholars and Martian teachers taught. That in the final now, Mat will overcome its faith. Righteousness, good, truth, justice, propriety, harmony, balance, reciprocity, and righteous order will overcome its faith, chaos, injustice, and oppression. I believe that. I'm committed to that. That's our struggle in our organization. Damn. Well, family, we are in school tonight. Show your love. Show your love. This is definitely um, one of the classics. Happy talks. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of blown away. Dr. Karanga, in what ways can we truly personify the principles represented in Kwanzaa? What are actionable things we can do in our homes and in our communities? First of all, let's understand. Appreciate what you said. If I understand correctly, the first and most important thing is to learn the holiday in ways that preserve its integrity, beauty, and expansive meaning. I repeat, in ways that reaffirm and preserve the integrity, the integrity, the beauty, and extended meaning of the holiday. We can't do quick things with Kwanzaa. We can't get a little book real quick and 
Go to any internet and just find it. Go to the Kwanzaa website. Get your Kwanzaa website and study. Get the book, Kwanzaa, A Celebration of Family, Community, and Culture. If you want to get deep into the study, right? The European is always going to take you away from that. They're going to quote everybody else but me and Bob and the the website. But you have to read it. You have to read it and know it. What is the expanded meaning? They'll reduce it to song and dance, and that's what they'll put on. I swear I don't do I don't do interviews unless they want to talk about the philosophy behind quantum. That is how we do. Basic data, you know, did I ever think it was going to do this or that or how many people sell it? That's all right. I mean, we can do that. But me, I think it's important for us to discuss the values, right? What does quantum mean? What does Umoja mean in a time that we live now? How do we keep our choreography of closeness, right? How do we move rhythmically together because COVID has interrupted the rhythm of our lives, right? How do we That's take this value of Umoja and of Ujima, collective working responsibility, and any of the other values and use it to enrich and expand our conception of who we are and what we must do, right? So the first thing is to learn, right? And to listen and to learn and to study. The second thing is always share your knowledge learning community right we got to dialogue together we got to think together you know sometimes people oh i got to think by myself well guess what that conversation is straight out of europe right i think by nobody really thinks by themselves they think with concepts and the question is if you're conscious of the concepts you're thinking with you can see whether they're right or wrong but if you're not conscious of the very concepts you're thinking with, you can become conceptually imprisoned. Conceptual imprisonment is one of the greatest problems we have today in the world, where people are imprisoned in the frame of reference they are using, in the concepts they use, in the language they use, so that they can't discuss themselves except in pathological terms. One of the greatest powers in the world is the capacity of a society to define reality and make you accept it, even when it's to your disadvantage. And that has happened to so many people. They tell you who is beautiful and who is ugly. And they'll make you take a knife to your nose, chop your cheeks off, bleach your skin, cut your eyes even with the edge. They can do all kinds of things to yourself. They make you, as we say, interpret in Fano, make you doubt yourself deny yourself, condemn yourself, and then mutilate yourself both physically and psychologically. But it also always happens psychologically. Before the physical attack on yourself, it's always a psychological issue. And so I'm saying Kwanzaa teaches us self-determination, right? We got to think for ourselves, Malcolm said. We got to listen for ourselves. We got to learn for ourselves. Then we can judge for ourselves. And make sure you're doing it in community with each other. You know, we are mirrors to each other and models for each other. And we must, in fact, look into each other. The other thing is, have study groups, right? Have study groups on Kwanzaa. We talk about it. Also, put the principles in practice in your daily life. Get up in the morning thinking, how can I practice unity? How can I practice self-determination? in my school, in my job, in the other places that I go. How can I do that? Do, am I really an Ujima person? Do I really work together? Or am I a loner, you know? I mean, yes, you know. We're not wolf people. We don't go off away from society talking about I hate society and all of that. You know, that's, somebody else can do that. We need each other, right? We come into being in relationship with each other, and we must practice that. So that's finally it. Practice the principles on a daily basis. Discuss them in community and in your groups, right? Read more and more all the time. Be a constant learner, a constant learner, a continuous learner. And never, never accept the definitions of the dominant society about who you are and what you should be about. Mm. Mm, Powerful. Uh, uh, Dr. Karanga, so dealing with um, the principle like Ujima, we see a very unused, or my, I'm sorry, in my opinion, a very unused strategy for liberation in our community. 
What is your vision for cooperative economics and what ways do systematic oppression impact this? Yeah, but appreciate what you said, if I understand correctly, we built and helped inspire cooperative movements in the South as well as in the North. And we argued that we have to put, we have to have operate under the principle of Ujamaa, which in practice means two, two overarching things, shared work and shared wealth. That we build our wealth together and that we share it and that the harvest uh, uh celebration which is um uh, you know Kwanzaa is based on is rooted in the idea of planning of planting of planting together planted together cultivating the seed together and the plants and harvesting together and then sharing the fruits of that harvest right and so that's the same thing we duplicate in this cooperative and that we put more emphasis on the people. We put more emphasis on the people than profit. Capitalism puts emphasis on the profit, right? Capitalism can kill millions of people and call it progress and the move westward, right? Or manifest destiny, right? Look at them killing millions of us and calling it trade, slave trade. Not the Holocaust of enslavement, but trade, right? Hey, how can you call that? As Walter Rodney said, there's too much violence involved in it for anybody to call this trade to be anything similar to what trade is all about, the change of goods and services, right? So I think it's very important for us to learn to share. That's the principle. Julius Yeti uh, introduced this concept, and, and, and certainly you were asking me who else um, the people uh, I borrowed from and built on and learned from, uh, and I mentioned uh, Mwalimu Julius Yeti, and he introduced uh, Ujima, and he said one of the most important things you can remember about it is that it is human focused and it's a question of how can we improve the lives of our people and it's also a communitarian philosophy it tells us we should share good in the world that there's a common good that is in the world and we should cultivate it create it and share it together so i think that's important Certainly in times like this, where there's unemployment, where there's a lot of suffering and poverty, how can we overcome this if we don't share? So shared wealth, shared resources of all kinds, shared knowledge as a resource. Sometimes, you know, we it's not a question always of products, right? It's a question of resources, of sharing what you have that'll help people live good, decent, dignity-affirming, life-enhancing, and world-preserving ways. That's what that's about. And I think it's so important. More and more now people are talking about cooperative economics, right? But before they should say, oh, uh, you know, this is back for the reformists or something like this. But now Cuba even is doing it. So now uh, they've embraced it as something that you need to go forward. But we've always argued this. That whatever we think about democratic socialism, on the way there, people have to learn the values for sharing. That is key. And the most difficult thing for Americans to do is to share on the basis of shared work and shared wealth. That's a very difficult thing for them to do. But an ethics of sharing is key to the future of this country and the world. And by an ethics of sharing, in Kawita, this we have this idea of the ethics of sharing as a fundamental way to engage each other. And cooperative economics is one of them. So we say that the greatest good is shared good. That if you think of the greatest goods, I'm not talking about pleasure. I'm talking about goodness, right? Things that benefit, especially the maximum amount of people. That the greatest good are shared good. So we talk about love, shared good, freedom, shared good, justice, brotherhood, sisterhood, marriage, family, shared good, right? Right? And we can't have it in its full form. It's just a few have it. We must share it with everyone, right? And so we have to share first shared status, no inferior or superior people. Everybody has to be recognized as an equally valid and valuable way of being human in the world. Second, shared knowledge. One of the ways the Europeans uh, are, are trying to keep us from understanding who we are and what we are and create the sort of It's to outlaw our learning. Now to diminish our capacity for you, to kill us in the third grade. So we come into the third grade, we're happy and we're learning and by the fourth they change the way we think about ourselves right and so one of the things we have to do is have shared knowledge when knowledge 
is a life affirming activity, right? With a dignity affirming activity, with a mind and heart expanding uh, activity. And we can talk about that, you know, because we've read enough about uh, the miseducation of black people by uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. We need to discuss it and see how it plays out and then block it, struggle against it mightily, right? When we say shared space, we got to share the world together, the country, the not neighborhood, and especially the environment. We can't let the corporations plunder, pollute, and deplete the world, right? To destroy the basis of life on the planet. Here we say ecocide means genocide. To kill the environment is to kill ourselves because that's the basis on which we live. So we have to share this space equitably and also shared wealth, shared uh, power. I talked about shared wealth, and I'm talking about cooperative people now. You know, it's wrong for 80, uh, 10% of the people to control 80% of wealth. It's worse than that now, but this is one of the figures. Just imagine that, right? How, how does this happen? How do 144 million people remain below the poverty line? Why do we have so many millions and millions of homeless people in what is called one of the richest, if not the richest country in the world? We got to struggle over that, right? We got to struggle to create a just and good society, shared power. People have to have um, a po uh, power over their destiny in daily lives. They have to control the space they occupy, right? They have to know what is possible and what they must work most at, and they must have. Mm. capacity to live good and meaningful lives. And without power, they can't do that. It is immoral to disempower people. And they're doing that, not only with voting rights, but on every level they can with us. And then, of course, shared interest. Interest in what? The right and dignity of the human person, the well-being and inclusion of family and community. Reciprocal solidarity of humanity and incorporation for common good, and finally, respect for the integrity and value of the environment. Those are common interests, I think. And then finally, we say shared responsibility for building the good world we all want. Those are some of the things I think we could think about and work with. Wow. Dr. Karanga, it's been a pleasure. Uh, <laughs> We got to do this again really soon. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Yes, I always like to close like this. After all of that, what I've said, this is our duty, Black people, African people. It is to know our past and honor it, to engage our present and improve it, and to imagine a whole new future and to forge it in the most ethical, effective, and expansive way. And this too, Black people, continue the struggle, keep the faith, Hold the line, love and respect our people and each other. S practice the Nguzo Saba, the seven principles. Seek and speak truth. Do and demand justice. Be constantly concerned with the well being of the world and all in it. And dare help rebuild the overarching movement that prefigures and makes possible the good world we all want and deserve to live in and leave as a legacy worthy of the name Africa. Mm. All right, Dr. Karanga, if you can just hang out for a second or two backstage, I'll be right there. I'm gonna close this out. I uh, just wanna just talk to you for a brief moment. Um, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank Dua, you. Thank, thank you for coming. coming. Happy New Year to you and all your audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, same to you, same to you. All right, family, listen, <laughs> I wanna say my head is hurting, but this has definitely been one of the more extraordinary interviews. Um, definitely want to get this out to many people if we can. I'm kind of a loss of words. Um, just want to kind of go over some of the things we were talking about earlier with the uh, screening next weekend in Houston, uh, January 8th and 9th. Uh, we got the lectures, Professor Smalls and Dr. Nobles on the 8th and uh, the film screening and um, the panel discussion. Or sorry, I'm Hotep, Dr. Vera Nobles, Dr. Uh, uh, Wade Nobles, Professor Smalls and myself. We'll be on the panel. Uh, definitely want to shout out to people who supported the um, show Cash App Love. Uh, definitely the um, Super Chats. Thank you, Tiffany Wright. I uh, see my man in the building, Dr. Chika Kua, good friend. Um, 
Dennis Boatwright, Jackie McBride, Ken Lee Harris. Just thank you to everyone. Diamond Net 2009, Drysic BCF. These are strong, happy people. Uh, definitely Ken Lee Harris. I loved a lot of your, your, your comments and your posts. Definitely a mic drop kind of evening. I want to leave the elder hanging too long. Um, yeah, the other thing is um, for those businesses, people who signed on kind of late, we had the commemorative um, One Africa Return to the Soft Source book we're putting together. You'll be in history alongside the great scholars that will be there. Uh, please email me, happyfilm.com, if you are interested in taking out an ad. And with that being said, peace and black power. <laughs> And we'll see you soon. Peace. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority. Honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community?